So um, welcome to the second Critical Antiquities uh, workshop. Um, as Ben said, I'm Tristan Bradshaw. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate in uh, political theory at Northwestern um, and an adjunct lecturer here at the University of Sydney. Um, so for those of you who haven't already attended the workshop, I thought I'd just give a little bit of a spiel about what it is and what we're on about so that you feel in the loop. Um, so the workshop's an initiative of the Critical Antiquities Network, which was established by um, ben Brown, who's uh, lecturing Classics and Ancient History at the University of Sydney, uh, and myself uh, earlier this year in 2020. Um, and the network aims to connect scholars working between ancient traditions and contemporary critical theories. So the idea of a critical antiquity, at least for Ben and I, uh, is to treat antiquity as a standpoint from which we can grasp the nature of modernity uh, and, and thereby also critique it. Um, but also we want to treat antiquity as the object of critique because we simultaneously recognize that um, as with any human society, there are deleterious forms of thought and practice that are embedded within it um, and not only in our own modern context. So Ben and I think that uh, among modern thinkers, Karl Marx really inaugurates and best exemplifies this kind of approach to critique and to antiquity. Um, so in the course of his lifelong critical endeavor, Marx draws on Greek, Roman, Peruvian and Slavic antiquities in his work into great effect. Uh, and we too wish to bring a broad range of ancient traditions into the network, even though Ben and I are more confined to working on the, uh, sorry about that, to working on uh, Greek antiquity. Now I use the term um, critical theories when I talk about the kind of critical theory that we're interested in, um, because critical theory is often used to refer to the Frankfurt School chiefly and narrowly. Um, but critical theories rather is uh, actually Martin Saar's term, who is at Frankfurt now. But Martin Saar um, recognizes that there's a broad range of contemporary thinkers who in the spirit of the Frankfurt School, but also distinct from them, are questioning the quality of rational thought in modernity, the forms of domination that modernity instantiates and ways that we might emancipate, emancipate ourselves from them. Um, so these are the kind of guiding principles of the Critical Antiquities Network and this workshop. I'm um, really delighted to have Vanessa here today because she also exemplifies these kinds of approaches in her work and she's going to be illuminating um, the work of many of um, the, the broader tradition of critical theories um, that I alluded to before. Um, so I'll hand it over to Ben um, who's going to MC our um, workshop today. Thanks Tristan. Um, I, I just. Uh, uh, just a quick note too that. Um, um, uh, sorry, man. Sorry, just a quick note that um, uh, at the end of uh, Vanessa's presentation, uh, we will um, uh, have some time for questions, um, and that uh, if anyone would like to ask a question, to um, to just write the letter Q in the chat, and then I can uh, and then I can make sure that everybody gets a chance to either um, uh, write their question or to pose it uh, verbally. Uh, on the screen. So it's with great pleasure that I uh, um, can introduce uh, Vanessa Lem to our Critical Antiquities Workshop. Uh, Vanessa is a, a leading international authority on Nietzsche um, and has published extensively on the intersection of Nietzsche's thought with key areas uh, of interest in contemporary theory, critical theory particularly, including areas such as biopolitics, animality, post-humanism, anthropology, and gender studies. And uh, <clears throat> she has an extraordinary ecumenical background, which um, uh, includes the New School of Social Research in, in New York, King's College London, uh, University of Paris Sorbonne, um, uh, University of New South Wales, do I, do I uh, throw, throw that one in there as well, um, uh, with a, a, a wide range of positions across the US, Germany, South America, Australia. Um, and uh, again, um, uh, extend her, my congratulations to her for being appointed as the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Education at Deakin University in, 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 uh, in, in, in Melbourne. Um, Vanessa's uh, recent book, amongst many publications, uh, is Homo Natura, Nietzsche, Philosophical Anthropology and Biopolitics, published by Edinburgh University Press, which looks like uh, a wonderful um, uh, volume and an addition to Nietzsche's studies. Um, and in addition to that, uh, Vanessa is one of the editors of Nietzsche Studien, 
Um, and so we are extraordinarily uh, 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 happy to have her present today on the subject of the return of ancient cynicism in contemporary philosophy. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for the for the generous uh, introduction. It's a pleasure to to present today. So I've took um, the the uh, invitation uh, very and, and the, uh, at, at the at the letter. It's a, I think I think it's a Ben Tristan uh, approach. We said it's a workshop network or workshop series. So what I would like to workshop today with you. So I'm not presenting the outcome of a research project, but I, I'm presenting a research project that I'm currently working on and I'm in the midst of it. So um, I'm very much looking forward to your insights and questions and feedback at the end. So I prepared a little PowerPoint because I know sometimes uh, technology can be tricky and uh, the transmission is always, not always as perfect as we would wish. So I'll, I'll start sharing my screen now and uh, talk you through my PowerPoint. So, do that. Double click. Yep. Yeah. And I go to slideshow. Yep. Yeah. 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 Slideshow. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and I go forward. Forward would be one second. Add the arrow keys. Okay. All right. So, what's my project about? Basically, um, the project has uh, two key objectives. Uh, on the one hand, the first thing that I want to argue is that ancient cynicism is actually a philosophy of community. And it has mistakenly, I would say, been understood as a form of individualism but so my argument is what I would try to or my take on ancient cynicism is that it's a philosophy of community so my project advances the hypothesis that ancient cynicism is a philosophy of community so through a careful reading of ancient sources and an engagement with contemporary scholarship on ancient cynicism I seek to demonstrate that the cynic idea of a cosmopolis pioneers a new thinking of community that has so far not been sufficiently acknowledged in the reception of ancient cynicism. So in contrast to the view that the cynic ideal of individual freedom prepares the way for modern individualism, I wish to make an argument for cynic cosmopolitanism as a powerful thinking of community. The second objective or hypothesis that I'm, I'm working on is, uh, is objective is to, to make a contribution to contemporary debates on, this new th on the new thinking of community and to demonstrate uh, the relevance of ancient cynicism for those debates by tracing a return of cynic motifs in contemporary continental philosophy in particular in the works of Foucault, Agamben, Derrida, Esposito, Sloterdijk and so forth, and to, to name just a few. So uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into the detail of each of those authors and their work, but I just want to just provide you like the, some of the main works where I see traces of cynic thinking. Of course, uh, Peter Sloterdijk's work, The Critique of Cynical Reason, is quite explicit about its cynic, its inscription within the cynic tradition. And as, um, as you know, is the work that has made him as a philosopher world famous in, in 87. But also, for example, in A Given Time, uh, Counterfeit Money by Derrida, you may recall the figure of the beggar in one of the uh, short stories that uh, Derrida analyzes and I would like to argue that that particular figure and Derrida's analysis should really be, it's, it, Derrida does not directly link this to the cynics, but really the, the, the figure of the beggar and this idea, this uh, breaking the uh, circle of, 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 the econo of, the, of the economy and, and exchange of money really goes back to the organist of Zenobo, who, if you wish, is the first uh, beggar, in a sense, in, in, in the history of perhaps Western philosophy, at least theorized that way. 
And in, in Communitas Esposito is my second point of reference. I rely on his idea of community quite a lot, as well as his analysis of uh, the, sort of the autoimmunitary paradigm. So not only Derrida, but also Esposito. And interestingly, I think using one could nicely use, or what I will do is using sort of Esposito's conceptual apparatus to bring it to the cynics. And I think one could write an additional chapter to Communitas, which would begin with the cynics. Um, in Foucault's The Courage of Truth, this is probably the most prominent work that uh, features a return to the cynics, I mean, explicit return to the cynics because of the chapter dedicated, or the really long elaborations Foucault dedicates, dedicates to cynic paresia and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I think in many ways it is probably thanks to Foucault that, that we are now talking about a sort of return of ancient cynicism. We can start to talk about that at least. Uh, and then finally, I think that uh, a lot of Agamben's thinking, for example, in highest poverty, his analysis of poverty and monastic rules and form of life really uh, have a very, very strong affinity with the cynic conceptions of uh, poverty, but also cynic conception of use. And I would like to um, uh, basically establish those um, links between Agamben and, and some of those uh, in, the, in the cynics. So that's just to give you a, a bit, little bit of an, of an overview. So really what we, and this is again, very schematic. So, uh, so if, if you'd have to sort of say in a nutshell what uh, Slotterdijk's idea um, of, of cynic reason is about, it's he's looking for an idea of truth that's non-systematic, that's performative, that's transformative, that's embodied and lived. And I would, uh, so as, as we will see, I think that is the kind of idea of truth that actually Foucault finds in the cynics, but also that we can, that I'm seeking to bring out in, 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 in the cynic reception on some of the bits and pieces that we know of the cynic, of cynic texts. And again, in, in Derrida, I think there's a thinking of justice as some, a non-reciprocal relationship, a non-contractual relationship, a economical an idea of gift, justice as an idea of gift giving. And here again, this idea of justice, this idea of, of exchange, of, of a non-economical exchange or gift giving can be traced back to the cynics. And then as thinkers of community, esposito, this idea of a non-essentialist, non-historical, non-linguistic, non-immunitary idea of community where that brings together singularity and community, I think can again be found in, in cynics. And the idea of the philosophical life with truth as understood as non-identitary, non-pure, mixed up, or as Foucault says, the true life is an altered life. And this is an idea of the philosophical life that, that goes back to the cynics. And uh, finally, there's a thinking around um, uh, on the law and the natural law in the cynics that nicely reflects or nicely uh, can be related to Agamben's uh, thinking of, of uh, form of life outside of uh, disciplinary or, or forms of power or, or, or domination. So this is just to give you a little bit of an, an overview of how I how I basically sketch this, um, let's say, contemporary landscape and the points of connection that I want to establish between some of those contemporary theories and the cynics. So if you look at the question of community or what is known as the new thinking of community, uh, from uh, starting with Bataille and Blanchot to Nancy Agamben and now Esposito, of course, there's a whole other tradition of thinking of community that's not related to continental philosophy that, you know, is related to the idea of from Rawls to Taylor to Habermas, perhaps, uh, or Forst, which is less relevant for me, but which I, I'm, I'm keen to tie into this conversation as well. I think one aspect of this new, or what this new thinking of community has shown is that the traditional conceptions of community as, as Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft have really become obsolete 
because they don't offer us or they're not the concept the concept don't, don't allow us to think um, in a productive way the problem of difference and that's what I say summarize as the problem of community and singularity they don't um, offer ways of thinking the problem of the gift or what I relate to as the as community and gift giving uh, and they are of course very language centric and hence don't have offer a way of thinking the problem of life or what I refer to as the problem of community and biopolitics or biocosmopolitics if you wish. So to sum up this new thinking of, of community, I, I see it as, a, as three paradigm shifts. So the first is a shift uh, summarized under the heading community and singularity. So the first is a shift from the idea of what one has in common with others is some essential feature that is shared by all members of the community to the idea that the only thing common to all is that there is no common essence to self aspirations of belonging to a common we. So this new meaning of community leads to the question of the relationship between community and singularity. What does community mean when the people that form it have nothing substantial in common, no shared territories, identities or values? How can a bond be established between people when there's no one thing that unites them or how can difference be what keeps people in community? The second paradigm shift uh, is articulated around the concepts of community and gift giving. Or, so there's a shift from a social contract model of community to a practice of gift giving where the recipro recipro reciprocal obligation to give without return becomes a constitutive feature of social life. So um, here basically we see um, in this age of global economic crisis and perhaps the pandemic may be another good example here, this, that social relations become increasingly asymmetrical where members of the community stand to each other in a relation of giving actually. So we enter into a community with others, not in view of our private gain, but on the presupposition that we will lose individual benefits. And it is on the basis of this calculated loss or risk that people that we hope to build a, a build up a future return. So here this shift in the meaning of community leads to the question of the relation between community and gift giving. What does it mean that nowadays people seek the society of others without thereby gaining any measurable advantage or what does it mean that community requ requires an obligation to give. And then finally, there's a paradigm shift which I summarize under the heading of community and life. And so here the presupposition of community from the fact of language to the fact shifts to the fact of life because it, because it is this last fact that allows us to think about forms of community that engage with other non-human living species. So in the conventional understanding of community, the common bond is typically constituted by language. However, in the age of the Anthropocene, it is becoming an ever more pressing issue and the human issue species is called to create communities and learn to be in community with other forms of species life, including the life of animals, plants and other more complex assemblages of life, such as rivers, seas and so forth. So these communities can no longer be based on the assumption that all participants share the same human language instead is a shared biological or geological life that seems to be the unifying force between a human and other species of life. And so this shift of meaning leads to the question of the relation between community and animal, plant and earth life. What does community now mean when the relationship to another becomes post-human? When is a relation of relating to other forms of life? So how do we live in common or communicate with other non-human forms of life without being able to exchange either words or reasons. So these are the question. Now, my hypothesis is, or what I'm going to argue, is that actually these questions of community can be answered through the cynics. So I want to argue that the cynics actually provide some really valuable insights and in how to address these three questions of community and the relationship between community and singularity 
community and gift giving and community and nature. So first, um, uh, cynic cosmopolitanism establishes, on my account, a bond between human beings that is actually based on difference and singularity. And, and so in this sense, my reading of the cynics stands in contraposition to Martha Nussbaum's latest uh, recent advocacy for a ray of, uh, return to the, what she calls noble but flawed tradition of cosmopolitanism. So for Nussbaum, the main uh, contribution of Diogenes of Sinope, who you know, is a founder of the most known uh, cynic, is, is this moral ideal of uh, equal human dignity, which is for her not only the center, central feature of cynic cosmopolitanism, but also a principle at the heart of political liberalism. So Nussbaum really wants to appropriate the cynics and their idea of cosmopolitanism to put forward a stronger notion of political liberalism. So this, from my end, so this idea of uh, equal human dignity in Nussbaum is inscribed really within the constitutional basis of the modern nation, nation state, which for Nussbaum is a key component in the advancement of cosmopolitanism. So this depiction of a cynic cosmopolitanism is in that sense at the, at the opposite, opposite end of what I want to argue, namely what I put into the foreground. So when you look at Nussbaum's book, and we, we can discuss this afterwards, and I'm sure some of you have, have read it, um, she actually doesn't discuss the cynics um, a lot. I think it's probably just one or two pages. And uh, on the basis that we don't have the cynic texts, and hence it's a lot of speculation, and we should you know, not overinterpret the cynics. Probably from her perspective, what I'm doing is precisely that. I'm sort of over-interpreting the cynics. That could be a, a criticism on, from a sort of Nussbaumian perspective, and leaves the cynics aside and goes straight to the Stoics. And this is a typical gesture in the reception of the cynics that, um, and, and, and I think it's, it's quite common that sort of the Stoic idea of cosmopolitanism gets projected back onto the cynics and we lose sight of the actually uh, uh, the difference and the distinction of, this, of cynic cosmopolitanism versus uh, stoic cosmopolitanism because from my point of view, they're actually two different pair of shoes. And whereas from a stoic idea of, you can, I think, um, build this um, Nussbaumian uh, conceptual framework on the basis of stoic cosmopolitanism, but not cynic cosmopolitanism. So what I want to argue is that cynic cosmopolitanism presupposes, for, before all, an experience of exile, where the latter is understood as an affirmation of difference and singularity that runs counter to the constitution of the Greek ethnic-based polis. So the cynics maintain that to become a cynic requires embracing exile. It requires leading a nomadic and wandering way of life in exile. And that stands, in my view, for an affirmation of singularity over and above the particularities of a given city-state or a given culture one may have been born into. So for the cynics, community does not define one's identity or a place to which one returns or from which one emerges. Rather, community designates a place of non-belonging that unites all those who are excluded and who resist both the immunitary logic of the ancient polis and this false cosmopolitanism of Alexander's, Alexander the Great's imperial politics. So in my view, the idea, the cynics idea of freedom is inseparable from their thinking of community. So the cynics, individual freedom and community go together and are far from the kind of individualism that has typically been ascribed to them throughout the history of, of Western philosophy. Um, so the second uh, question, the question of community and gift giving. So here again, the cynics, in my view, ex provide a great example, provide a great example of an experience of community where the obligation to give preserves not only the community, but also its individual members. So cynic poverty 
what it um, what it says is it it's on the one hand um, it is a um, rejection of the polis and of the relationships with the, the in the polis, including the economical relationships, as that which protects individual life. So that would be from a from a esposito as from an immunitary uh, perspective. These would be immunitary relationships that shut off the individual or the human being from nature. Instead, for the cynics, poverty actually means embracing the fullness and richness of nature. It actually means living off and in community with nature rather than living, uh, maintaining one's life thanks to those relationships that have been formed in the cynic, in, in the polis. So the cynics provide a positive account of poverty that has, in my view, so far been misunderstood by interpreters as an element of their asceticism. So William Desmond, for example, will make so it's actually a fantastic book uh, on, on, cynic, on cynicism, the cynics and poverty. But for him, it is he traces the roots of this idea of poverty back to various ideas of asceticism. And often uh, poverty in the cynics or this idea of reducing your life to a, a minimum, right, uh, has been interpreted in sort of ascetic um, terms. And I think that's completely misses the point of what I would call sort of the, the affirmative idea of poverty in the cynics. Or it has been um, interpreted as an aspect of their moral psychology. So here again, Nussbaum would be a good example. So it's, it's basically, um, again, a projection of the sort of the, the, the stoic, the, the stoic resilient, uh, resilience against external circumstances and so forth and so forth. And uh, uh, as, as uh, and, and poverty would in this, in this sense, just be um, a means to demonstrate how independent and resilient the individual is. And I think completely again, misses this uh, affirmative idea of poverty in, in the um, cynic. So to become a cynic, requires giving up all one's material wealth and adopt a life of radical poverty. So the cynics rejected the idea of work. They radically rejected to be part of the whole economy of, um, uh, of, 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 of uh, to be part of the economy and of, of work. So, um, which of course nicely ties to some of um, Agambian's um, thinking around uh, inoperativity and, um, and, and poverty. But uh, well, I won't discuss this here today. So um, the cynics reject property for they believe that community is not a property or an entitlement, but rather that we are all free to use what is at hand and that the wealth of nature is common to the inhabitants of the earth. So that's including animals and other species. So poverty is actually also, and this idea of, of gift giving is also one way the cynics think uh, or conceive this community of life. Um, and then the, the final paradigm is a community in life. And here I, I argue that the cynics advance an idea of cosmopolitan, cosmopolitanism that provides an example of what it means to live in common or communicate with other forms of life without needing to exchange either words or reason. So according to Diogenes, to become a cynic requires living according to nature by literally adopting the way of life of the dog, as you, um, as you know, kunos in, in Greek means dog, and um, Diogenes of Zenope repeatedly or frequently referred to himself as a dog. So in ancient cynicism, the affirmation of nature as the highest source of value and truth comes hand in hand with the search for a community that is not based on the immunizing separation between nature and civilization. And so finally, really these three aspects of community, of three components, the constituents of this, the cynics thinking of community, uh, exile, uh, poverty, 
uh, life uh, or, or uh, culminate or come together um, in, in this idea of, of paresia, of the philosophical life as, a, as an embodiment, uh, um, as, an, uh, as an embodiment of truth. So exile uh, as a figure of singularity, poverty as a figure of gift-giving and animality as a reflection of nature stand for this constitute for con I call them constitutive practices because for the for the cynics it is all about and I think that's one of the aspects that Foucault grasped so well it is really a praxis it is a, about a form of life it's a, a rather than um, a, 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 an intellectual corpus or uh, a work which comes to their, their fullest expression in the cynics uh, paresia, so the practice of speaking the truth to power. So to, to become a cynic again requires the courage to speak the truth without reservations. The uh, encounter between uh, Diogenes of Zenope and Alexander the Great is probably provides one of the greatest examples in the history of Western philosophy of um, how the speaking to the courage to speak the truth without reservation can look like. And uh, cynic paresia advances a vision, I would say, of the philosophical life that is, in, in that sense, really politically relevant. And cynic cosmopolitanism, and, and that is important because it has often been in the reception of the cynics, it has often been claimed that the cynics really are apolitical or radically reject the polis, which is of course true, but that is precisely the in, in part the value of their, the political value of their philosophy and, and nicely speaks to the framework of the critical um, antiquities networks that Tristan fleshed out or presented at the beginning. So cynic cosmopolitan, cosmopolitanism envisages a community of life that is reflected in the embodiment of truths in the philosopher. And so here, of course, we can look at this Foucaultian account of this idea of embodiment of truths. But I think the, the, the philosopher that, um, that, you know, as, as you know from Ben's uh, presentation that is, uh, um, I'm interested in uh, Nietzsche, takes this question of the embodiment of truths really serious. And he's probably one of the first to ask this or to bring back this question of the cynics, namely how truth can be embodied, how truth can be lived. Um, so moving forward, oh, this is just a slide on, on Foucault and Paresia. We don't have to, um, I can skip this one. I think you're probably familiar with the, with the text. Um, so I'll just skip forward. And, and so this brings me to the, just to summarize, so to these, what I call the four constituents of um, ancient cynicism. And, and they're very different from what you may find in the literature. And then, so that is a little bit, um, I, I was um, uh, talking to, to Ben before um, the, the, the session that because I'm not an ancient scholar, uh, it's very, very, um, and I don't, um, I, I don't, don't read Greek or Latin, so I, I feel, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I can make those claims, but okay, here, here, here they are. I think there are four constituents of ancient cynicism that haven't actually been covered in, in the literature. And there are singularity and difference, which are reflected in this idea of exile. There is poverty and gift giving, which is reflected in, in this new idea of giving up all material wealth and living a life of radical poverty. There's an animality and, and life so affirming nature, leading a natural life and leading the life of the dog. And then finally, life and truth, living embodied truths by speaking the truth without reservations or speaking the truth to power. So for the cynics, again, this is, these are not, um, and that's why perhaps the, the word for constituents is not, not the right word. They're really practices. So it's by leading a life in exile, it's by leading a life in poverty, it's by leading a natural life, it's by leading a life of truth that you can actually call yourself a cynic. And so for the organist thing and for the cynics, this was, there was no expectation that, not, not any, or let's formulate it the other way around, 
not anybody, anybody could become a cynic. That was actually to live those, to, and they're not principles, but to live this life of a cynic is a really a life of, of hardship that is not for everyone. So um, I want to say a few things to sort of bring, so that, that's kind of largely my account of the cynics. And I wanted to say um, a, a few more things about um, the lens I bring, uh, let's say the contemporary lens that I, I bring to the cynics. So I think that, um, so what, I, what I'm doing is, so on the one hand, I'm bringing the cynics to contemporary philosophy, but on the other hand, I think there's also, uh, there are contemporary conceptual innovations in continental philosophy that is interesting to adopt to the cynics. So the analysis of the autoimmunitary paradigm in continental philosophy, I think is a very um, fruitful way of bringing to light or shedding light on this ancient thinking, ancient cynics thinking of community. So I suggest that the kind of autoimmunitary crisis we experience today may have been happening to the Greek polis at the time of Diogenes of Sinope. So it's worthwhile recalling here that Diogenes' life coincides with what scholars refer to as the decline of the polis civilization. So from the beginning of the fourth century, we see a change in the way the polis operates and its role in the world. So history of the Greek city moves from a golden age of independence, marking the traditions of freedom, equality, and autonomy of the polis in the sixth and fifth century, you know all this, to increasing reliance on alliances and leagues to ensure safety in the late fifth and fourth century, to complete subordination to powers of the monarchs from 323 BC onwards. So the year actually, interestingly, uh, Diogenes of Sinope dies, which um, according to uh, of some uh, sources was also the day Alexander the Great died, which, which I, I think is one way to uh, highlight the par paral the, the parallel or the affinities uh, I don't know whether the word parallelism exists between Diogenes and Alexander. So from, the perspe from my perspective, the problem of the polis, according to the cynics, is that it set up barriers of immunization by instituting a series of norms and customs, such as those of wealth and property, to protect, protect the individual citizens of the polis against the claims of community. So I argue that the cynics call for the return to nature aims to provoke an overturning of a politics that installs immunitary boundaries between human beings towards the becoming of a genuine community that rests, rests on the wealth of a shared life in a common world. So the cynics uphold this idea of a cosmic community or a cosmopolis, co cosmopolis, which prescribes that all citizens are free and can make use of the gifts of nature to satisfy their needs. And he thinks that that is a much stronger alliance or a much stronger community than the one instituted by the police. So, um, uh, so here, here I'll, I'll, I'll um, I'm, I'm, this, is, this is actually my, my last uh, slide. So I think interestingly, if you look at the history of the reception of the cynics, it, it, this you can uh, see that it actually, uh, I, uh, at least I read it, and that's my hypothesis, read it as a history of increasing immunization against their thinking of community. So um, it's common knowledge, of course, that we know the ancient cynics only by saying that it's by what has been transmitted about their philosophy and way of life through other sources. Uh, Diogenes Laertius is probably one of the most read works, but there is a, um, you know, and I think uh, uh, Foucault, to some extent, and, um, has that included, gives a little bit of a history of the reception as well of the ancient cynics. You know, so you have various moments of when this cynic, cynic philosophy or cynic themes return. But according to um, the history, or accordingly, because really we know the cynics only by saying that it's only through the reception of others. We don't have access to their texts and 
whether actually they had any texts is already was a much debated uh, thing in, in, in antiquity. So because this, this history of reception or this, this um, non-direct access to, to, to cynicism has produced this curious fa fact that by studying the cynics and the multiple ways in which their philosophy has been interpreted, we learn just as much about the cynics as we learn about their readers. And we actually always have to keep those two readings or those two interpretations um, uh, ongoing. So, so this, from my point of view, may explain as well why there are so many divergent interpretations of a cynicism reaching from cynicism understood as a radical form of asceticism to a pagan model for early Christian communities, from a universal ethics of freedom and autonomy to a revolutionary practice of defacing the false values of a dominant culture and to an embodiment of truth and so forth and so forth. So these interpretations of in, uh, ancient sin, however, I would say that these um, interpretations of uh, ancient cynicism in, in their variety really typically really uh, uh, they're, they're, uh, oscillate between two poles. So on the one hand, we have those who celebrate their courage as the highest form of philosophical truth. Two, um, and at the other spectrum, we have sort of re rejection of their philosophy, philosophical practice as primitivist and animalistic. So from my perspective, this dualism is symptomatic of the autoimmunitary auto um, paradigm. So the dialectic between affirmative and negative readings of the cynics reflects a movement of increasing immunization where interpretations functions as means of protections against the threat of undifferentiated community reflected in the life and thought of the ancient cynics. So just as modern political philosophy erect, erects an enormous apparatus of immunization against the claims of community, that is, as you know, uh, what Esposito maintains, I argue that the history of Western philosophy and its reception of the cynics reflects an attempt to protect philosophy from their thinking of community. So the history of, of, of reception of ancient cynicism reflects, from my point of view, an, an increasing interiorization of their philosophy that culminates in the figure of the cynic as the first advocate of individual freedom where freedom is understood as an inalienable property of the modern individual. So if my hypothesis is correct, then this would explain why, um, how and why the cynic ideal of freedom has been transformed into sort of a hyper immunitary individualism into self-interested egoism and cynicism. So today, um, the true meaning of the cynic idea of cosmopolitanism as a thinking of community has been lost. And when we speak of cynicism, we mean nothing but, and this is a, a quote from the dictionary, a person who believes all people are motivated by selfishness. So that's the cynic. Um, in, in, and as you know, in, the, in German, to distinguish the ancient cynics from this modern or contemporary notion of, of, of what it means to be cynic, they created two words. So it's cynicism, which is a reference to the ancient cynics, and cynicism, which is a reflection of that kind of person who believes all people are motivated by selfishness. So I think it is interesting that we have in modernity reached uh, such a reduced idea of cynicism as basically um, self motiv selfishness. And what has been lost in my view in this history of reception is precisely the intimate connection between freedom and community on the one hand, and hence my project is all about bringing back that connection between freedom and community and bringing back ancient cynicism as a powerful thinking of community. Thank you. So that's the end of my PowerPoint. So I'll, I'll stop um, sharing my screen and we can um, open the discussion. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, I, must, I must admit that was a, a, a fantastic 
um, presentation and perhaps even a lecture on uh, on on ancient cynicism um, <clears throat> uh, that was extraordinarily informative um, and very lucid too. Um, I, I, I was, I don't know if you could see it, but I was taking notes furiously. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, now, uh, uh, as I said before, if people would like to ask questions of Vanessa, um, just type a Q um, in the uh, in the chat. Um, and then I will I will get to you and you can um, uh, ask your question or if you'd prefer you can simply write your question and I'll speak it uh, read it out on your behalf. Uh, Tristan, you have the uh, you have the first question. Yeah, thanks, um, Vanessa. That was wonderful, very very stimulating and very enjoyable. Thank you. Um, so I was just thinking about Diogenes of Sinope and the circumstances under which. Um, you know, the account goes that he adopted the cynic way of life. So the story, as I understand it, is um, Diogenes is born into a banking family uh, and at the point at which he started defacing the currency, um, literally defacing the currency, um, he was exiled from the city. Um, and it was as a result of that exile that he kind of adopted these radically new forms of life um, that become become so um, characteristic of cynicism. And I was thinking about um, the circumstances under which he was, um, he became a cynic, I guess, um, and what that means for understanding cynicism and the cynic way of life. So in, in some, my question is, um, do you see that the forced exile of, of Diogenes um, was somehow necessary and essential to his adoption and improvisation of new ways of life? Or do you somehow see that the, the adoption of a cynic way of life was rather more of just an extension of his initial effort to deface the currency? And I guess the reason why I'm asking is I'm wondering to what extent is it necessary for us to be forced to change our ways of life from kind of external imposition um, and I can think of all kinds of ways that contemporarily that might take place, all the kinds of crises that, that our civilizations and our world faces that might force us into radically new modes of life and community. Um, and to what extent, or to what extent you think that rather the refashioning of life in the mode of the cynics is something which one takes up for oneself by say, defacing the currency, but more metaphorically as, as nature um, went on to reinterpret it as a, an attempt to revalue, you know, life and revalue values. Uh, I think that's, that, that, is, that is a great uh, uh, question. And, and, and I'm, I'm not sure I, I, have, the, I, have, the, I have the answer. Um, but I think I would, I would make uh, several points. So one point I think is, is and again, I'm not, not a historian of the ancients, so you are the experts. Um, but I think the, it, during, in the historical times, the exile was not uncommon. There were a lot of movements of people and there were a lot of people who actually did not have the status of citizens and who, who were um, uh, sort of extraordinary movements of people. And I think Alexander's uh, imperialist politics in great part contributed to that. So it was not unusual. Uh, so that, that to, to find oneself in that um, uh, position, I think. And, and that is one of the reasons, I think, why uh, the cynicism has often been sort of uh, appropriated as a, as, a, uh, as a philosophy of the people or of the, of the of, yeah, as a philosophy of the people or popular philosophy, because it speaks from this perspective of the underdog, the exile, the, uh, you know, the non-privileged and so forth and so forth. So I think that that's one aspect and exactly that's, that's more kind of the, 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 the historical strength. But, but on the other hand, I think what Diogenes does is that he actually reverses, when people ask him about, you know, his exile and that he's been exiled, he says, well, he, he reverses this and says, basically, look, I'm free, but the people of Zenopa are tied to Zenopa until the end of their lives. So 
they are actually the ones who are unfree and I'm the one who is free because precisely, you know, I've left Zenova and I, I'm not tied to the polis. So I think very strongly, and I think when he says where he's from, that's when he coins this idea of cosmopolitanism um, and then the different expressions that are used in the, in the, in the, in the sources. Uh, he refers to the, the, I, the only place I belong to is the, the earth under my feet, or um, which basically means anywhere, right? Yeah, uh, and uh, uh, and that he's and then that's where he sort of coins this term. I'm I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a citizen of the poly of the cosmos uh, rather than one particular polis. So again, emphasizing actually that that's what I I see as this um, thinking of community that the important relationship is that cosmic relationship is the relationship to to the whole community of life to the community to the community of the cosmos over and above the sort of relationships that you form within an individual the political relationship within the individual points um, so and i think this this idea uh, or this this capacity to reverse the meaning, the value of his experience, which comes back to that just defacing the currency. And it's not clear whether that Diogenes defaced the currency, or whether that was his father, or so there are various, there are different anecdotes around this. Mm. But he turns this again into, well, what is philosophy about really? It's about, you know, this transvaluation or this transformation of values of uh, changing the value of values. So, um, and, and then this is exactly what he does with respect to exile, that um, basically rather than seeing this as something that's forced on him, he will say this is a liberating experience, which doesn't mean that it's not difficult. Yeah. That... Thank you. Um, Andre Lax, you have a question. Yes, you can hear me. Um, thank you very much for, for, for this wonderful talk. Um, look, I am a specialist of uh, ancient philosophy and uh, the, one of the things I haven't studied is cynicism. So uh, it, it won't be very informed, but still um, I have one question uh, or, or, or two or even three. So one, uh, one question is that uh, I completely agree that uh, asceticism is not the right word, but still there is, uh, what I do remember is that uh, the word uh, ascesis, ascesis, the Greek word ascesis plays a central role in every presentation of uh, um, uh, Greek uh, cynicism. So what, what, what one question to you would be, you know, wh wh what is the place of ascesis in the Greek sense of exercise? Uh, has to do with, uh, so, which is not as, uh, asceticism, there might be a relationship to it, but it's uh, something else. So wh wh how do you construe it? And it's the more important that in some sense, Foucault uh, also builds on, you know, ascesis. So that was one question. The second question is about uh, freedom. Um, Yes, of, of course, in the, in, in the, I mean, I trust you, I haven't read the book, but the, the control of, uh, of freedom as freedom of property for, for the cynicism seems to me very Nussbaumian uh, and incredible. Um, but still, uh, uh, freedom also plays a central role in, 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 in and so, uh, you construe freedom as freedom from the police because of cosmopolitanism. Um, it, it's very attractive, of course. But in some sense, I feel that I think that uh, a counter argument could be construed on the line um, actually. This, the cynic needs the police in order to be what he is. Um, so that, that, that would be an objection to the, to, to the contraction, which might be you know, related to what you say, but still there is a tension here, which I feel you, you, yeah. you don't consider. 
And this has something to do with uh, actually what means cosmopolis. Yeah. Because your, your interpretation of cosmopolis is cos cosmic community. I mean, you replace polis with community, and this can be the, 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 the community of all, all living beings and so on. But then, um, polis is not exactly that. And I mean, uh, I, I, I don't think that you have any hint in, in the evidence, but it's not, a, uh, it's not a question of evidence, because I think it's, it's, it's unlikely that Diogenes would have said, my dog is part of my polis. What of of the same police as as I do? I mean, it 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 it, it it's one thing to compare one thing to to say I am a dog, and to say dogs are with me as you know part of the cosmos, and so I think that that, that there is more to say about yeah. this. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, thank you. Thank you. So this is a, a great, great question and, and really helpful for me as well, because you are, of course, I would fully agree with you on the difference between ascetics and, and asceticism and, 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 and would agree with you. The idea of exercise is, of course, crucial for the cynics and, and for, as well, for uh, Foucault's uh, interpretation of the, of the cynics. So, um, so again, I, I'm, I think what I'm, what I try to be, or what I'm critical of is those interpretations where that are trying to fold uh, cynicism back onto a form of individualism, where it's all about self-discipline and self-exercise, you know, self-hardship and, 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 and so forth. So but that 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 does not mean that the idea of praxis and exercise is not important for the cynics and it is important precisely because for them philosophy is before all a way of life it is actually a, a praxis in that sense it is only built on those exercises and that is the i would say that this also the experimental moment of cynicism uh, typically i think the kind of experimentalism that, that Nietzsche loved as well, which is, okay, well, let's try this out. Uh, let, I'll take myself as a guinea pig and see whether that is actually possible. So philosophy is all about exploring and experimenting with different forms of life. And that is exactly what the organist does. That, oh, uh, what, why do I need a cup to drink if the dog can drink just, or the, with, you can drink with your hands. I don't need uh, this action is basically a, a tools of civilization to drink. Um, so it's all, it is um, in that sense, um, there, there remains this idea of, 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 of exercise and, and as, as I would say, continuous uh, experimentation rather than in this sort of sense, as you said, as, of an aestheticism, which is a form, continuous form of self-disciplining. Um, so that would be my answer to the first question. To the second question, um, this is an, an excellent question, of course. And basically, uh, the, how I understand cynic freedom, and then this is where sort of some of those paradoxes of the uh, cynic philosophy come in. Absolute, so freedom for the cynics actually means radical dependency. Because by giving up all their material wealth, the cynics re expose themselves, they're radically exposed, they make themselves radically dependent on others. So they're radically dependent on the gift of others, which doesn't mean that they take from anyone. So as you know, a Diogenes refuses the gifts by Alexander. He also does not uh, uh, take gifts from some of uh, the rich people in the polis that he doesn't appreciate. So he, he is selective, he doesn't take anything but he's radically dependent on the relationship to the other and exposes himself to the other. And I think it is by making themselves so uh, radically vulnerable that on the one hand, that is liberating, but on the other hand, it actually literally proves the point of community that he lives thanks to the other. 
And it is in this, that is how I understand community. So community is basically, in a way, um, and what, what the, 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 the cynic experiment is all about is how much can I abandon myself or how much can I throw my, make myself dependent on others, really be at the mercy of others, if you wish, uh, and still maintain that relationship. So it's a radical uh, dependency that is, that is what ultimately ties, uh, is, is the tie of community. And, and here the dog would obviously be part of it because so it's the dog or animals or plants are, are part of, 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 this, um, of this relationship because on the one hand, uh, Diogenes, I think, observes the animals and learns from the animals. So I think so, so that, that is one, one aspect. But on the other hand, of course, we all, <laughs> despite everything, live off um, nature. And by demonstrating that, that he, the organist, is stronger and more alive than anyone else in the polis, so to speak, he says the community of the cosmos is stronger than the community of the polis. And it's interesting because there are many anecdotes where Diogenes they feature Diogenes's body and people it, 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 his body is always described as radiant and um, he must have had a, a very um, strong presence um, featuring also I think of course his 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 health his well-being and his strength while being, of course, the most vulnerable person, the most exposed that you can imagine. So that's the cynic experiment. Thank you. Uh, a question from Swati. Uh, so hi, Vanessa. Thank you for your presentation. So obviously, I'm not a research uh, scholar on Asian philosophy, but, but going by your presentation, I still understood three of the major conceptions that you linked with. One was community and singularity. Second was community and gift giving. And third was community and life. So obviously what I saw these three principles, I actually saw them as the ideal principles that one ought to follow. So my question would be how the conception of cosmopolitanism, which you said, justify the contemporary conception of life. For example, how do you relate the cynical conception with say, racial differences in today's life or the debate between the vegetarianism or the non-vegetarians or the caste differences. So how do you justify these two positions or how do you justify the cynical thought in the present life which we are dealing with? Yeah. Well, that, that is a very, very difficult question, Swati. You have to help me answer this one. Um, uh, and perhaps you can share a little bit more about the debates that you refer to. Um, and um, look, look, I think uh, you could, of course, say, well, it was the organist kind of a vegan avant la lettre, so to speak, because uh, he he, uh, he he basically he didn't eat any meat or, but he never it was never out of principle and i think that was would probably be one big difference between sort of contemporary veganism for example and and, and uh, cynicism because basically it's a life of open experimentation and doesn't exclude uh, as a matter of principle one thing or the other so the idea is for you know just talking about diet and so on is to eat or to live off, and I think the formulation is kind of what is at hand, what is close by, because the cynics rejected uh, work, they rejected um, sort of a, a, whole, a whole economy that is, um, as you know, the whole Greek household, uh, the oikos is basically a, a, a system that is tailored to keeping life alive. 
um, so they reject that system and it's only and instead rather than having a sort of let's say complex complex production and um, of of life and, and um, preservation of life the cynic is recommends to live of what is nearby that is and in that sense they were it is said that they're very simplistic but really what is the idea is probably eat local produce um, don't be picky you know if if what is at hand is that kind of food then you eat that rather than something else but very um so so i think there's a certain uh, simplicity to it i'm not sure this is the answer to some of the debates you refer to perhaps you could say a little bit more what what you what you have in mind so just so the major question which i actually had was that obviously all these three things are very good and and one ought to follow these principles i do abide by them but seeing the social political conditions of where we live and how we live i think so it's a bit difficult for us to imbibe all these principles so yeah that was my conception that how yeah, yeah. no i th i think that that is absolutely right and i i think they I, i think they're very val valuable and I, i think actually a lot of sort of contemporary movements could be looked at through a cynic lens i haven't done this extensively but this whole i, I mean recycling obviously is really you know if if you look at it through a cynic lens what could give it so what well, is that perhaps uh uh, uh could, could that be traced back to sort of an, a cynic idea of give, giving of ex, of of the sort of this continuous uh, flow of of uh, uh, goods Uh, rather than exchange uh, and so forth and so forth so i think it's probably best to sort of pick out things that you can actually translate into your life that that speak to you rather than embracing the whole package which is which is i would agree with you is very difficult yeah thank you vanessa for your response yeah i i i i i i i haven't I probably haven't answered your question very well <laughs> um so it's difficult to solve all the problems of the world at um you know 10:30 in the morning <laughs> <laughs> um we have a question from Sharon Can you hear me now? Certainly. Yes. Oh, okay, sorry, I forgot to unmute. um i was struck by the uh, a parallel with uh, st francis of assisi who mm. uh, came from an italian city state in the renaissance a wealthy family took off all his clothes to symbolize his rejection of their wealth um preached to the animals and um and of course wanted to live by begging and the begging of course is a radical demand for community to mm. emphasize the commonality of uh, everybody I didn't really have a question. I liked very much the observation about what well, the whole paper of course, but I liked your observation about uh recycling and uh as a way of um cutting off the uh the circulation of uh goods and similarly uh his uh, his gestures as those of Diogenes uh, have to be understood as a form of uh as a demand and as a form of social communication so in relation to what he had say yes it does have to be adjusted to the circumstances one is in at the moment so obviously uh begging for example doesn't really make the point that it used to that um other forms of activity uh, presumably will of course francis's message didn't go down very well since his followers were burnt as heretics but um let's hope that things can go a bit better uh, at least for some people this time around mm -hmm. thank you so much for that so uh, th thank you so much for the for the comment sharon this is really much appreciated and and i, I look i fully agree with you and 
and and Agamben in his book on highest poverty is is basically an, uh, a reading of Saint Francis and and the um, Saint, the Franciscans. So I think Agamben misses I think the connection with Diogenes and there's quite a, a little bit of literature on or sort of um, fleshing out the hypothesis that perhaps even Jesus. Um, was a, a, a cynic and uh, that there's a direct uh, transmission of, of, or there's a direct con con connection between sort of early Christianity and um, cynics. And obviously, uh, so San, Francisco, uh, San Francisco is, is a perfect example of, I think, a, um, a return of the cynics. Yes, I think uh, in relation to your point about this has been, uh, the, the cynic message has been uh, subverted in the tradition of Western philosophy. I think we could say that there are uh, other moments at which its uh, communitarian aspect resurfaces. Correct, yeah, I would agree. Uh, I have a, uh, just a, a couple of uh, brief questions slash points. Um, uh, there's an interesting tradition of, of, of truth tellers in Greek philosophy as exiles or, or those who self exile. I mean, I'm thinking about Heraclitus, for instance, um, as somebody who withdraws and gives up um, his role in his city, a very, a very important role in his city in order to, to practice not the ritual political life of the city, but to practice truth. Um, or to, or to practice awareness. Uh, um, Socrates, of course, is a, is a classic case in point who seems to have both one foot in the citizen camp. He's a fully paid up member of the city and he participates in Athenian democratic life. And yet he's also uh, figuratively exiled because he tells the truth. Um, you know, he's, he, he's the wisest man because he's the one who knows that he doesn't know anything and so on. Um, mm -hmm. Um, and so that these are all kind of paradigms that seem to foreshadow Diogenes as a kind of extreme version of that. But all, the other thing too is that, um, uh, and that maps onto the, the figure of the philosopher changing from being the pragmatic citizen located at the heart of the city to being the a pragmon, the, the person who does, who actively withdraws from his political life, for which Plato, I think, is the first major figure in, in Western philosophy of the of the of the of the philosopher who says I'm withdrawing from the life of my city, um, and yet on the other hand, he creates his own city in the Republic. <laughs> um, uh, then there's the figure of the dog. I mean, I'm <clears> that we keep coming back to the dog um, as a as a sort of animal to think with. Um, and Diogenes is a radical truth teller, isn't he? Because isn't forgive me if I'm if if I mistake this or I'm forgetting forgetting it, but he says in answer to, to someone who says, why are you like a dog? He says, it's because only dogs can tell the difference between friends and enemies, right? Um, and I bite the enemies and I savage them. Whereas I'm, you know, I, I speak the truth to my, to my friends. So I, I, know, I identify my friends. And there's a kind of radical notion of truth there, which is an instinctual truth, right? I mean, I, to be a dog means to know the truth in it at, at, at a kind of, at, a, at, a, at an animal level rather than at a human level. And I'm just sort of wondering if all of those, you know, we're, I guess since you've also worked on, on um, animality, um, where you locate the dog in all of this, because it's, it seems that the dog is very good to think with, so to speak. Yeah, so, so uh, I, um, I should probably, I, I, when I was doing the slides, I was like, oh, I don't have Donna Haraway in there. I should, because obviously, uh, you know, um, uh, she has quite a lot to say about uh, dogs and living with dogs and so on. Uh, so, so I, I think, I think it's. Uh, th thank you so much for for um, bringing up Heraclitus and Socrates, and I think they're very different from Diogenes in um, the fo in the following way. So, I think Heraclitus obviously retreats to the cave. He's a hermit. He doesn't want to have anything with the politics. So he's really radically, if you wish, apolitical. Where Socrates, in the end, dies for the police. 
So he actually, he never gives up on the police. He embraces the police and he dies for the police. So, so, so he's in that sense at the opposite end, both are uh, uh, opposite ends of Diogenes because while Diogenes uh, retrieves from the police, he is, he sets up camp in the middle of the police. I mean, the, 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 the cynics are always known for, they're not out there in the countryside anywhere. They're like where the people are. They're in the marketplace and the brothels and the taverns. and They're in the midst of it, in the thick of it. Um, so yes, there you go. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, I didn't have any images in my, in my PowerPoint. I'm really bad with that. I, I need to work on that in the future. Anyways, but um, so... Uh, so, so, the, so the what the cynics actually are advocating for, I is that's my view, is a different notion of politics, and that's a, in in the reception of the cynic, that's completely, that's just not brushed away. It's always are oh, the cynics um they're apolitical, they're against the police, they're they're really there's no political thinking here at all. But ultimately, what they are, uh, um, what they are questioning is precisely the separation of public and private instituted by, by, politi by the police. Uh, and they're radically political in that sense. So that's, that is just on the difference between, um, between uh, uh, Heraclitus and Socrates. And, and Plato, uh, uh, of course, uh, I know there's a, the, an anecdote that he said, uh, uh, Diogenes is, uh, is uh, 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 Socrates gone mad, yeah? Because, Precisely because uh, kind of a, he's, that's kind of the irrationalism, the so-called irrationalism of of um, Diogenes. But the dog, I mean, Plato himself also uses this uh, figure of the dog to, or the this capacity to make distinctions as a distinguishing feature of the philosopher, uh, him or herself. So. It is a topos that's quite common throughout antiquity, that of of the of the dog, um, and there are various anecdotes. So, so there's this. So I, I don't have it now all in, in my head, but there's a lot of literature on precisely this capacity of for distinction that's associated with the dog and associated with the philosopher. And there's a, and so it would be interesting to further look at the difference that capacity of distinction plays in Plato's Republic and in uh, Diogenes' Republic. So there's some, so, some uh, according to some sources, Diogenes also wrote a Republic. And while they have some features in common, like the idea of community, of commu for example, that all children should be shared, and this idea of, of, of this sort of communism in, in, in the Republic, um, which is a feature that, that you also find in, in Diogenes' Republic, according to, to some interpreters. But so, so what do I, I make of, of the dog? I think it's, um, and again, there, there are various anecdotes and sources, but um, I think it's, it is the, it is the moment, so according to one anecdote, it's like the moment when he sees the dogs just basically, you know, drinking water from a puddle. So, oh, there's a much simpler way of life that's possible. So I want to live like the dogs. And according to other anecdotes, it was others that called him uh, a dog. So, you know, I haven't, I have one, one chapter on, on in, in the book, this, this is a book project, so one chapter on, on the, on, in the book will just be about, about uh, this figure of the dog um, and, and animality and nature, and I haven't sort of tackled all the details yet, so if you come across anything, please send it my way. And uh, we've got a time for, for, for one last question, uh, um, and I can read out Stella's uh, 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 question in the chat. How could there be a community of cynics if they are entirely dependent upon the gifts of others? Yeah, so, so uh, um, I think... 
Um, I'm not, 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 I'm not, not sure exactly what the question is. So, the, the, this idea of community I refer to is not, I, I don't mean um, a community of, of a particular group because that would be sort of going back to the more traditional idea of community. So you're part of a community because we are all ultimately, you know, all the same. So we're all cynics and hence we form a community or we all have been born in a certain country or speak the same language and hence we form a community. So these are, I think, all let's say, uh, ideas of community that are based on, on some sort of essence or substance or identity. So the idea of community that I'm interested in is basically an idea of community that articulates a difference and singularity that is non-essentialist, uh, non-identary, um, uh, and where a bond is what what by what what relates us to the other, and that's that's the kind of the, the not sure it's a paradox or just a tension, but there's something paradoxical here, here obviously too, is is the fact that we have nothing in common. And so the cynics as, as, as a group of, they're not actually a group. So Diogenes, Diogenes is not known as being part of a group. I think there's, there is a cynic movement that follows Diogenes where you could speak of a, of a movement or, or a group. It actually is, it, 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 it persists for quite a long time, I think over 600 years. So that's quite significant if you think about it. But again, the, the idea of community I was referring to is not that traditional sense of a, of a movement or of a community that is uh, sort of rooted in, 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 in ultimately identity or the sharing of the same values and, uh, and so forth and so forth. Hope that answers the question. I I could add to that uh, the, the 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 anecdote about um, uh, Diogenes telling Alexander when Alexander asks him I, what would you like I can give you anything you want in the world <clears throat> and he says can you step out out of the way of my son uh, and so that he can get you know his, his, his the sun can shine on him it's interesting that that's that's a kind of a nice reference to the idea that the sun is available to us all. Um, it's a source of kind of indistinguish, inextinguishable energy, uh, but it's also, the sun is also understood to be the, the, the thing that gives without asking anything in return. Um, it's a, an, an eternal giver, it's eternal supplier of, of, of light and heat and warmth to all of us that, that asks nothing. Um, uh, there's no re reciprocity there. We don't owe any obligations to the sun. That Diogenes seems to say to, to Alexander, you know, who's the most powerful figure in the world, you know, um, step aside in exchange for something which is truly kind of uh, um, a, a sort of a supplier of, 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 of all our basic needs without, without any kind of, um, without, without having any deference or, or obligation. It's very interesting um, when we read those anecdotes like that. Um, we, it is uh, coming up to 11.30. Do you have time for, for, for one last question, Vanessa, from, from Hardik? Sure. Okay. Um, Hardik uh, has asked, um, how would cynics re react when items imported made far, from far away are cheaper than the one available from local producers and how should we respond to it? <laughs> I think probably they would say, they would say that so much hardship and work has gone into bringing products from far away, despite the fact that they are cheaper. They're actually much more expensive in terms of labor and so forth. That you should go for the cheaper one, where less work and labor went into. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I, I don't I don't want to uh, um, uh, to. Uh, take up too much more of your time Vanessa and and we are very appreciative of uh, your contribution to our emerging network and workshop and so I would just like to thank Vanessa again for a superb uh, presentation very enlightening 
um, and, uh, um, and, and, and thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, everybody. And, th and thank you for everyone for attending. Um, thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Lovely to meet you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.